Well, Jerry, first let me thank you for inviting me back to Williams College and CDE to celebrate with you the 50th anniversary of uh, CDE. I recall with nostalgia my time in uh, Williams College. That's uh, some 40 years ago. And uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, the college has become stronger, both the college as well as the CDE. Whilst for many of us uh, who are here, we are not getting stronger. <laughs> not physically, anyway. I want to focus my remarks on uh, how China and Singapore managed the impact of the global financial crisis and uh, make some observations which uh, may be relevant to the US. China, as you know, is an emerging economy, but a huge one. In fact, it's now the world's second largest economy. Singapore, on the other hand, is a small but open economy, which is therefore very vulnerable to external events. The direct impact of the US subprime and financial crisis on the financial sector, financial sector of China, Singapore, and in fact on Asia was fortunately limited. After the Asian financial crisis of uh, 1987, 1998, Asian banks were generally well capitalized and the balance sheets were strong. The exposure to subprime housing mortgages and collateralized debt obligations was very small. Partly because of prudence, but also partly because the financial players were less sophisticated <laughs> and had not dabbled in complex structured products. However, the knock-on impact on the real economy was large. As consumer confidence in the West plunged, stock prices and exports in Asia fell off the cliff. Nearly 7 trillion US dollars of wealth was wiped off Asian stock exchanges. In Singapore, being a globally connected economy, was the first Asian country to slip into recession in the third quarter of 2008. Its growth rate in 2008 was 1.8%, down from 8.5% a year earlier. In 2009, it was minus 1.3%, from a high of 8.5 to minus 1.3 in 2009. The impact on China was much less. China lost only two percentage points from its double-digit growth rate in 2008. So double-digit, single-digit, two, two percentage points, China could wear it. China's main fear was massive unemployment which could lead to social problems and chaos. To hit it off, China unveiled a 600 billion US dollars stimulus package in November 2008. That's, that was about 12% of China's GDP. That was the size of the stimulus package. The package focused on infrastructural works and stimulating domestic consumption. To drive domestic consumption as well as production, China launched two stimulus programs. The first was the Home Appliances to Countryside program. Under this program, rural consumers received subsidies of up to 13% of the purchase price of home appliances. So besides driving up production of these products, the program also raised the quality of life in rural areas. For the urban population, China introduced a similar old for new program. It provided subsidies of up to 10% for consumers who replaced the old home appliances with new ones. I'm sure in the US such a program would be welcome, had it been introduced. You exchange your old appliances for new ones, and that stimulated domestic production. So it's not just subsidizing the consumers, but it's also a means to stimulate production in uh, China. China also expanded the coverage of medical insurance and other schemes to reduce the need for precautionary savings and hence encourage spending. 
Unlike Singapore, China s trade is three times the size of、uh, its GDP. So, our economy contracted sharply in line with the four index ports. But for us, stimulating domestic consumption would not be the answer because whatever we would have spent on、uh, doing this would have flowed out in buying goods and services for Singapore. So, what did we do? Because pump priming for us, I think, would not be the solution. So, we concentrated on Building resilience in the economy. First, to prevent the potential outflow of bank deposits, we put in place a blanket guarantee for all bank deposits in Singapore, including those in foreign banks in Singapore. <coughs> we had to do so even though our banking system was sound, because other jurisdictions like Hong Kong, Malaysia, <coughs> and Australia were doing so. Not to do so would to risk an outflow. Of、uh, deposits from Singapore to these countries in a time of uncertainty. Next, as banks tightened their lending, we had to ensure that our companies continued to have access to funds. This is what we call the credit squeeze a phenomenon. We introduced a special risk sharing initiative. The government shouldered the risk of up to 80% out of the loans of the banks, taking only 20% of the risk. That means for every loan that the banks made, if the loans went、uh, sour, the government would absorb 80% of the loss in the loans. So this incentivized banks to lend, we therefore avoided the credit squeeze. Third, we put in place a resilience package, not an anti-recession program to stimulate domestic consumption and production. This package cost us some 15.5 billion US dollars, or about 8%. Of our GDP, the resilient package aimed to encourage employers to hold on to their workers and to upgrade their skills in readiness for the economic upturn. First, to stave off retrenchments, the government introduced a jobs credit scheme. <coughs> Under the scheme, for a limited period of up to two years, the government provided a grant to employers to cover 12%. <coughs> Of each local employee's wages, kept at 230 US dollars per month, together with other measures such as cutbacks in bonuses, reduced overtime, and in some instances, <coughs> voluntary and involuntary no-pay leave, our companies were generally able to ride the downturn without having to retrench workers. So the key feature here was a flexible wage system. Where wages went down, instead of companies having to retrench workers. Second, we incentivised employers to use the low period to upgrade the skills of the workers under a skills program for upgrading and resilience, or SPUR, as we call it. Under this scheme, the government subsidised up to 90% of the course fees at a payroll. Of those sent for training and reskilling, so this not only reduced the holding costs of、uh, keeping workers on the payroll, but also helped companies and workers to reposition themselves when growth returned. Our approach of cutting costs to save jobs, rather than cutting jobs to save costs, worked. Unemployment rose only marginally. To a peak of 3.3 percent at the height of the crisis, and when the global economy turned the corner, our companies were able to quickly ramp up the production to meet the surge in demand. Workers were there; they were better trained than before the crisis. For this reason, our GDP growth rebounded by a massive 18 percent in the first half of this year. And output has recovered to a level that is even higher than the pre-crisis period. For this year, our growth is expected to be at the top end of the 13 to 15 percent range. I would hesitate to draw lessons from the way Singapore and China handled the financial crisis for the U.S., especially when I'm in the U.S. <laughs> 
One, the structure, size, and complexity of the problem for the U.S. and the Asian countries were vastly different. Second, the fire storm was in the U.S., while the Asian economies felt only the heat. But I want to make four points. One, innovative activities. Richly prevalent in the U.S. as the most productive economy in the world, carried to the extreme, can contain far-reaching risks, as seen, for example, in the IT.com bubble in the early 2000s and the recent financial crisis, which saw the widespread use of highly creative credit instruments. While innovation should not be stifled, we must understand the products fully and be aware of the attendant risks. Also, we must build up buffers to address possible spillover or tail end or tail risks. Hence, banks need to be well capitalized and corporations should not be over leveraged. With regard to banks, this refers not only to an appropriate level of tier one capital, but also its quality. <coughs> Two, growth of the property sector and the stock markets must be based on underlying economic fundamentals. Regulators must be vigilant of short-term speculative bubbles, <coughs> leverage of cheap liquid funds. Asia learned this lesson from the property and stock market bubble in the Asian financial crisis. In Singapore, we are always on the lookout for potential bubbles especially in the property sector. We periodically act preemptively to let some air out of property bubbles before they burst with a bang. The use of direct and targeted tools and administrative measures, for example, imposition of maximum loan-to-value ratios, stamp duties on transactions, control of land sales, have proven to be effective. Broad monetary policy actions may not be the best means since they can be blunt and, if applied too aggressively, can have unintended negative effects on the entire economy. Three, though I do not think this could be done in the US because of the size of its economy and its free market philosophy, a scheme to save jobs by sending workers for training during, during a recession and to reduce costs for companies may help in maintaining confidence and morale of the workers. We found that to be very important in the recession if you can retain the morale and confidence of the workers that proved to be very valuable. Finally, I will reiterate that globalization is beneficial to all countries, both big and small, both developed and developing. Asia has always recognized this reality through its outward-oriented development strategies. Globalization presents both opportunities and challenges. Policymakers can no longer formulate and implement policies based on a closed economy model, which sometimes larger countries like the US might be inclined to do, at least for some sectors, under political pressure. For the next decade, I believe Asia will continue on its open growth trajectory. This will hold much economic opportunities for the U.S. It is better for Asia to be coupled with the U.S. than for it to be decoupled. Thank you.